Well, we are going to continue now into verse 6, exactly where we left off last week. And what I stated originally is that we are in the Gospel of John, so this will not follow the synoptic layout of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does go his own way. But what he's doing now at this portion of the prologue, he is showing us again more the supremacy of Christ, and he's going to continue to build off his first statements that he made. And so we get right into verse Verses 6 and 8. There was a man having been sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Now, the words may escape us quite quickly if we're used to just kind of going through the Bible rather quickly throughout the year. But what John is doing at this point, he is laying out very clearly the biblical mandate for witnesses. And that is a, a highly important point for us to start off with this morning. John is showing that he is a credible witness. He is a witness that has been um, come. So John the Baptist is not the one that wrote this, but John the Apostle is showing that John the Baptist is indeed a credible witness and that this wit witness was sent by God himself. That should cause all of us to take a quick pause and say this is very, very important. Why does Jesus need to have a witness? What is going on in this? Well, Paul does give us an answer in 2 Corinthians 13, 1, because Paul, quoting the Old Testament, says that every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And so we're starting to get into the apostles showing that Jesus' arrival, Jesus' life, his coming, has indeed been approved by more than just uh, Jesus' words himself. So the Messiah who is to come, there's something that consistently takes place. The Judaizers, the Stoics, the philosophers, there is always a challenge to the divinity of who Christ is. They challenge his authority. They challenge his words. They challenge his teaching. And so what has to happen is that there needs to be that satisfactory confirmation in this letter. We have to remember that John's not writing the letter as he's walking with Jesus, but John writes the letter after the resurrection. John is preparing this gospel, this book, in reflection of what took place in the past. And so what he is doing, he is confirming that Christ has come with a witness. Not just one witness, but there will be several witnesses. There is John the Baptist who is witnessing him, a prophet who is in the wilderness, and also the witnesses of Holy Scripture. The very word speaks of Christ's coming. The Old Testament makes it quite clear about the blessing of the nations through Jesus Christ in Genesis 12. We learn how that will carry over through Isaac and through our patriarch as it moves forward into the divinic line of Christ starting at Genesis 17. We learn about the eternal kingdom of David in 2 Samuel 7. So now what happens is in Scripture, you have Old Testament Scriptures testifying about the coming Messiah. You have John the Baptist who is confirming that he is the forerunner of Jesus the Messiah. You have the very teachings of Christ himself that is coming and what is happening. Things are being established by two or three witnesses. So John is for sure silencing anybody who wants to oppose to what he is speaking. If we want to go deeper, we can even go to Isaiah 7 about Christ and the virgin birth and what Micah says about Christ being born in Bethlehem in Micah chapter 5. So what John is doing is he's showing you that there are many witnesses behind his statement. There are many witnesses behind the very prologue. There are witnesses be uh, behind the coming of Christ. Christ is the ultimate witness. But there's also a few more. Does anybody else know who all the other witnesses may have been? We talked about the prophets. We talked about the word. We talked about John the Baptist. But there was also the witness of the angelic beings. In fact, in Luke 2, verses 8 through 11, it says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping the watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we know from the rest of that the angels were there, and they started 
started glorifying God in the multitude, and there were also yet another group of witnesses, which are the shepherds. And so in this very small prologue, with John understanding what would have been produced already by Mark, by Matthew, by Luke, these books are coming together through the ancient teachings, John is making it absolutely clear that Jesus Christ indeed is the incarnate word of God, the one who was there from the very beginning of creation, the one who is the creator himself because he is partaking in the, that creation. Verse 1, John 1, in the beginning was the word. He's tying all of this together to make it very, very clear his teaching is absolutely authoritative in this book. It has been proven by witnesses. So we just look at those few verses about the witness, and then all of a sudden, we'll go for verses 8 and 9 again. John said, he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens everyone. So John establishing this, he is showing that Christ's teaching, him as a rabbi, him as the son of God, he is indeed the true light that shows the truth and the way to all man. If I have done my job as a preacher and if I have preached properly in scripture, I have taught you all very clearly that we are responsible to weigh every single word carefully. Every word in scripture is not there by accident. It's not there because some translator wanted it in there. Every word in the original manuscripts are absolutely vital for our understanding. And in this, John uses this term. There was a true light. Do you notice there's a definite article there? John is not saying that there was a light. There was a true light, but he is the true light. We need to understand those words. Now, the world has always wanted light, has it not? Think about the history of all mankind. Humanity wants something better. Humanity wants brightness. They want a light. They want good. They don't want evil. They want something to look forward to. It, I don't have time to go back a hundred, oh, to ancient history. But I can go back very briefly for the last 150 years. Canada, at one point, demanded lightness. They wanted light. They wanted purity. They wanted truth. They wanted a country that would be led by morals and proper instruction. And therefore, they called for the resignation of the prime minister of John A. Macdonald over a railroad scandal. And they brought in this other prime minister, Alexander Mackenzie, to take on the role. And then when he comes in, everybody celebrated. Look, we have virtue of office. We have truth. We have life going on. We have something that we can look forward to. But the fall of man, that light was momentary. It became dark. It was fragile. But the world and the way we live, we get accustomed to things. Many of you and many around Canada right now, you believe Canada, the politicians, are the light. They're the ones who are going to lead us to enlightenment. They're the ones who are going to lead us into truth. There's no way they're going to cause us harm. They are about our betterment and our good. But may I remind you that there was a time in the early 1900s living in the dominion of Canada that people were trusting in this commonwealth. They were trusting in the dominion of light and truth. And they thought, we are in a Christian nation there's no way no how that this light would be disturbed and then all of a sudden on June 28 1914 Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by a young little Sarajevo boy at 19 years old that bullet that killed this Archduke started World War I the world was in chaos, and all of a sudden, darkness fell upon the land again. And everybody's like, we need light. And so what did the people do and the magistrates do? They sold it as the war that would end all wars. It is the time to send your daughters to the front lines, because this will be the war to stop all tyranny, to stop all injustice. This is what you're supposed to do for your God, for your king, and for your country. And then by the end of the war, in the November 11th, 1918, there was approximately nine Nine million military dead and 23 million wounded with 5 million civilians gone. Not much of a light, is it? It doesn't sound like the true light that the world was able to produce. It was bad. But John tells us something very clearly. 
in John 3, 19, that this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And so we know that as the world looks for a light, looks for enlightenment, looks for truth, they want to have something. They want to find a way outside of this mess of morality. They can't because their very works are darkness. But the world bounced back. The world says, you know what, maybe we don't need this Jesus so much. We've got this under control. We just need a little bit of religious morality. We need just a little bit of light. And then all of a sudden, things went for a turn. What happened in 1929? Well, the stock market that was sitting around 381 dropped to 198, causing people to panic. It showed that their God was in their money. That the light and the source of contentment was in something that they can produce. And the Great Depression happened. We had men jumping out of the windows because they could not bear the fact to live a life of hauling coal and not live in a suit in an ivory tower. But the light was extinguished. But what else happened when that light was extinguished? The world wanting a true light. The world wanting direction. They look to our prime ministers. They look to the kings and the princes of this world. And as such, a young bohemian corporal that served in World War II rose up into the ranks of Germany. And he created a party called the National Socialist Party. And he convinced all of Germany that he is the light. That he is the betterment for Germany. Just follow his teachings. Follow his principles. We will have a better society. Society. We will have a better light. We will have more knowledge, and I will enlighten you to what the problem are. What the problems are. People believed in him. They didn't realize that embedded into his core, he had a vehement hatred for the Jews. That he had an absolute anger regarding the June 28, 1919 signing of the Treaty of Versailles. He was angry and he wanted blood. And so what he decided to do while the world was resting in a false hope, he decided on September 1st, 1939 to invade Poland, which was the start of World War II. The light was broken. It wasn't the true light. It was a flicker of a light. The world once again was rocked because they put their hope in their source, their trust of their hope in something else. And by the end of World War II, 60 million deaths occurred. 20 million were military, while approximately 40 million were civilians. Jews, gypsies, blacks, homosexuals, non-Aryans were taken and gassed and killed because Hitler was a light of enlightenment to the people of Nazi Germany. But thankfully in May 45 and by August 45, the war ended. And what did the world do again? We have light. We have peace. We don't need to be on our knees praying anymore. We don't need to cry out to Jesus anymore. Let us just get back in our little comfort zones. And then the UN becomes a, a, a more established entity. And the Christians in the world says our hope and our light and our source of all contentment is in the UN. And the UN is going to provide us the security and everything that we need. We're going to have a better life because of the UN. And then all of a sudden, 1950, Canada finds himself in his first UN war in Korea. And then Korea takes, goes on. And then we have Iraq and Desert Storm. But we have long since have wars, don't we? So now we live in a country that says, don't we live in a beautiful light right now? We have a beautiful thing. You can be religious and have religious liberty. You can be a guy. You can be a girl. You can be a guy dog, girl dog. You can be whatever you want to be because we have found the source of light. You want to go in and get your privates removed? Go for it. We'll celebrate that. We have lesbian clergy. We have homosexual sodomites overseeing all kinds of denominations. But because we have peace, we have light. We have a light in the world that is going to satisfy all of our problems and our needs. Is that not so? And here we are living in a culture. Where's the true light now? For many people, for God so loved the world, he gave the world a vaccine. And if you pump that vaccine in your body, you will have life and contentment. For God so loved vaccination that he's going to radiate your body full of cancerous problems to give your life a few extra years if you're lucky. We live in a world where we have the government do things to us because we do not want to let go of this momentary thing and we treat everything and everyone as light when it's not light. 
toxins, drugs, booze, sex, porn, whatever you want to add, we treat that as some sort of enlightenment. We tell people that if you want to live long and prosper, then all you need to do is bow at the throne of Ottawa, bow at the throne of the UN, and everything will be A-OK for you. But that is not what Jesus did. When Jesus came as the true light, everything he spoke and everything he did completely rocked the so-called light that once existed. He is the true light. You go back to the very garden of Eden. He is there. The one revealing the path to righteousness. He is the one that tells us that there is no other way. No other possibility. There is no other path man can take. And Jesus tells us clearly. And John's already alluding to it. But he is the definite article. There is no other light except this light. Who is the true light that will give you eternal peace. Eternal security. And eternal hope. All those presidents are dead. All the prime ministers are dead. All the scientists are dead. They create a vaccine for polio. You will still die. You want to save your life by getting the COVID vaccine. You will still turn 98 years old and die. And if you do not know Jesus Christ, you will be in hell. So everything is a temporary light. Only the true light. Amen. So Jesus is the true light. And what does the true light do? Ephesians 5, 13. That all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. The darkness hides in the shadows. The darkness is why you have governments who are so corrupt. Why you have medicine that's corrupt. Listen, I'm not here to talk about your medical choices of what you did in the last three years. But again, I want to remind everyone that Adolf Hitler thought it was absolutely proper to you do eugenics on people who had Down syndrome as he gassed them in the name of science. They had no problem injecting people of of indigenous cultures of chemical castration for the betterment of science. It's not light, friends. The government is not light. It's darkness. And Jesus exposes all darkness because he's the true light. He is our source of light. We look at the condition of the world and we understand more than ever it needs the true light. The world needs to be enlightened and this is exactly what John is driving at. In a day when John was writing this, the Roman Empire was reigning supreme. They were cutting the heads off of Christians. If you did not pinch your incense to Caesar, you would starve and potentially be killed. Our brothers and sisters were stripped naked and hung on posts and set ablaze for the Roman streets to be lit at night. They were being slaughtered. Why? Because they testified about the true light who enlightens all men to what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel which says there is only one true king, one true ruler, one person that every knee will bow to and every person will bow and the magistrates and the kings and the rulers and all the people that were promising a temporary light, a temporary peace had to also bow and they hated it. So John is being very, very clear. Jesus came and illuminated the truth of humanity about God and about holiness. And in any time we place our love on anything above this, we are in sin. Jesus did not come like all of those that I previously mentioned to give a false promise to humanity. He did not come with a false hope He did not come speaking vanities. He came speaking truth. He spoke truth because as we learned last week, he is the word and the word was with God and the word was God and that is why his word is light. Because he is the true light. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all and his mercies are over all his works. So God loving this world so much sends Jesus in to expose the darkness. 
Make no mistake, Jesus preached a political message. And that was Pontius Pilate has no authority except that was given to him from above. That he's king. He's ruler. And it gives us hope. It gives us light. Now John's going to reveal more here about how Jesus is able to meet men where they are. Because in the statement, he is the true light, reveals the mystery of God and how he speaks. We'll learn this with his interaction with Nicodemus and how Jesus brought enlightenment to this conversation. The entire book is about God giving us light, exposing the darkness of this corrupt world, the true light which comes into the world, the true light that enlightens every man is seen in interaction with all of humanity. Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, male, female, white, black, red, yellow, all of us. The incarnate, now visible. Light, now present. Jesus being the true light has forever made a distinction. Outside of Christ, there is no light. No matter what your religious leaders tell you, there is no light outside of Jesus Christ. No matter what your political leaders tell you, outside of Jesus Christ, there is no light. Doesn't matter what your doctor promises you, outside of Jesus Christ, there is no light and truth. These things are good for us. It's good to listen to sometimes. But outside of that, no truth. And then, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Again, John not allowing any dualism within his message. He's not making any errors with his words. The Holy Spirit anointing John to write this letter. He's making it very clear that he was in the world. But when you look in the Greek, the word cosmos is being used. That Jesus was in the very world. He was in everything. Everything. Everything is his. Which the opening prologue talks about. And then verse 11, there's a repetition. He came to what was his own, and those who were of his own did not receive him. It's interesting. He came into his own. The expression here is that he came to his possession. Christ is walking amongst his possession. His people. In the very world that he created. And the sad indictment to that, my dear friends, if Jesus, and he won't, but if he were to walk through that door right now and to stand up here and preach a message, most of Christianity, A, would not recognize him, and B, throw him out and declare that he's a heretic. But he came to Israel, his people. As we said last week, the light, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness could not comprehend it. And then in verse 11, again, it carries it over. The Jews had no comprehension. Guys, gals, John 1.11 is an indictment. It's an indictment. It's a huge indictment. It's a rebuke against God's people. Again, he came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. This is not about election, about his elected people. His own is Israel. And not all of Abraham and are of Abraham. That's a huge thing we have to unpack. But the indictment is this. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also reject you from my, um, being my priest. Since you have forgot the law of your God, I will also forget your children. They don't know who he is anymore. They have forgotten God. Jeremiah 7, 25 through 26. Since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets daily rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffed their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. This is what John is throwing down here. They did not recognize him. 
And so many Christians in this world, in this land, have put more faith in science and in man and in institutions and politicians and temporary structures and sandcastles and don't even recognize Christ anymore. But the very Jews of the context are rebuked because the very scriptures testified that they are going and have rejected the Messiah. It's crazy. Christ goes around in this book, we're going to be reading how he preached, and they denied him. They ignored him. Constantly challenging him. They call his mom sometimes names. They call him a wine-bibber. They accuse him of casting out demons in the name of demons. All of the scriptures that the Jewish people had testified to Mashiach, he is in front of them, he tells them very clearly, and they do not know him. Just like the large majority of the Jews rejected him, and what John is getting at, and being rejected by his own people, we can say, as it was, so it is. And the reason that is because the religious people have in their heads about what Messiah would look like. They have deemed his physical appearance. They've determined what height he will be. They trusted sources of light in the ancient world. And because it wasn't the true light in which they trusted, they actually became blinded. And today we have the religious. We have the religious who claim Christendom. Yet in their head, Jesus is not what the scriptures claim he is. In their head, Jesus is who they say he is. They are people who determine what Jesus looks like, how he's going to arrive, what he accepts and what he does not accept, such as you even have ministers who will get up to a pulpit with the rainbow garments and their vestments, and they will make creeds that Jesus Christ is okay with sodomy and homosexuality and drug use and pornography, as long as it feels good and do it, though the very word of God rebukes every word out of their mouth. Why do I say that? Because even today in religion, he can be amongst his people and his people will not recognize him. The truth is in the word. And because we have put our trust in princes and magistrates, we reject reject the true light and we become deceived. Let's close off with the last two verses. Verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. I sure hope verse 12 and 13 are underlined in your Bible. At the end of verse 12, there's a very strong statement. That is, those who believe in his name. It's an expression that they trust the word. It's an expression that they trust him as the true definite light. They have received his teaching and his rebuke and his instructions. They're the remnant of the Jews. Think about that for a moment. This just popped into my head. Out of all the Jewish nation, when Christ came, there's only a small portion of them that believed. I wonder how many people are actually going to believe when he comes on the second advent who claim Christianity. Food for thought. But let's go back in verse 12, a little bit further. It says, but as many as received him, are you ready for it? Mic drop. He gave. He gave the right to become children of God. John is making it clear that it is God alone who gives the right to be called children of God. We are dealing with salvation right here. So even in the prologue, we haven't even got to chapter 2 or chapter 3, the beautiful chapter 10. Right here, John is making it clear that salvation is not that you deserve it, you don't earn it, you can't supply it. You can't maintain it. 
right here. It has been given by God is showing it is the absolute sovereign act of God himself to save his people. How can he do that? He's the true light. He's the word. He's the rock of ages. He is the sovereign. And by the Holy Spirit, we have regeneration. There's zero hope. So that little rant I went on earlier, like, why is Steve going off on the government? They've been pretty good lately. To show you there's no hope. You have no hope. You're done. Think, just let that hit you for a second. Nothing will save you. Your religion won't save you. Your money won't save you. Your medical health will not save you. Your political allegiance will not save you. You are absolutely, totally, completely hopeless. Ah, except for being saved by the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who gives hope and light to his children. That's why I went on the rant. To have you completely abandon yourself into the arms of Christ. To look upon him and gaze upon him as your only hope. Because it is only through him you have salvation. Friends, salvation is not a right. It's a privilege. I deserve hell. I deserve every ounce of wrath of God for the way I live and think and talk. Salvation is not a right. It is a privilege that God gives to his covenant people and he allows us to be children of God. Heirs to this glorious adoption. In this prologue, John is making the statement, listen, there's only one true light. It's Jesus Christ. And he gives you the right to be called sons and daughters. That's why the Christian can stand. When the doctor tells us we've got only a couple weeks left to live, when we lose the house payment because we didn't have a job, when all your friends and your family mock you and ridicule you. I don't care if a comet's coming down from this space itself to destroy us all. Nothing can shake us from the reality of the truth of the light who enlightens us through the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have great hope. And that's why John is making it clear. And then verse 13, a second beautiful thing, that there's a difference of birth so what's verse 13 getting at? Well, unfortunately, the Jews, just like us Christians, they had the wrong idea of what it meant to be saved. They had a wrong idea of what it meant to be a covenant child. They would be like, well, since I have the mark on my foreskin that shows the physical evidence that I have been cut and there's been a covenant made between me and Yahweh, I am of Abraham. And therefore, since I am of Abraham, I'm okay. And so they've thought that their regeneration or their salvation was based upon an external covenant that was made by the flesh and the hands. Even though Deuteronomy rebukes all that and says, you know, circumcisions of the heart and it goes into the New Testament, they were misunderstood. Just like we are. Again, John's writing this with philosophers in mind. Stoics. The early Gnostics. They weren't called Gnostics then, but the birth of Gnosticism was taking place then. So he understood what's happening here. So the first thing he's going to do is attack Israel's thought of genealogy. It's like your genealogy makes nothing. It means nothing. Your bloodline means nothing when it comes to your salvation. So he just kind of rebuked all of those who are boasting in Abraham or their ethnic Judaism. And then he keeps unpacking more and more. It's not going to be blood. It's not by the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. How beautiful is that? He's going to unpack this more in his letter later. But we know from 1 Peter 1.18, it says, Knowing that we were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold 
from our futile way of life, inherited from our forefathers. No, it goes on. We were redeemed with an imperishable. So our genealogy means nothing. And young people, if mom and dad are a Christian and you think just because they are, you automatically are in, as, in the covenant children, well, you might be a covenant child, but you still have to call it to God. Mom and dad's bloodline are not going to save you. Romans 9, 7, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. What is that talking about? Christ. You see how big this is? It's not through the will of man. It's not through blood. It's not through flesh. Jews cannot boast, neither can we, or assume that salvation is based upon our merit. And so many of us Christians get stuck in this. We think that we have to be the perfect Christian. We have to speak the most theological tapestry of elegance, talking about the doctrines of grace. That we have to attend church every Sunday. Some men have taken this to abuse their wives, that they have to walk such a perfect line according to perfect scripture or they're not in. Do you know what the the end game of being saved by grace alone is ultimately you don't have to do a single thing there's nothing you can do you can be the biggest screw up in this room right now and have a head full of sloppy theology and never get yourself straight and doubt and right and think that the whole world deserves to throw you away but because If you have been saved by grace through faith, God looks at you and that is good enough for him. This is how serious it is. It's not by blood. It's not by flesh. It's not by merit. You can muster up nothing. He loves you. He so loves you. You are the most precious thing in his eyes. You're the apple of his eye. He has delight in you. Zechariah 3, 16, 17 tells us that he sings over you in love. He woos you with lullabies. Your father loves you so much that he provided the only way you can be saved and that is by grace. That's what he's telling us. It doesn't depend on anything except for God. Are you struggling? Do you feel like you let God down? Maybe you think, you know what? It would be better if you just weren't at church and you weren't a Christian and you go back hiding in your corner, playing your Xbox, drinking your beer and watching your dirty movies because you just, there's no way you can figure this out. When John makes that declaration, not by blood, or the will of flesh, or the will of man, he's making it very clear about our hope. It says in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I certainly will not cast out. Because our salvation is not on merit, not on flesh, not on the will of man, it's based upon God. He cannot cast you out. He can't. It's an impossibility for God to be tired with you and to throw you aside like a sack of potatoes because we're chronic screw-ups. It's against his nature. John's making that very clear here. And the Jews who are listening understand there's no Torah reading. There's no temple sacrifices. It's not about the turtle dove. It's not about the oxen. It's not about the fact that I didn't memorize all of the Torah. None of that. It's just based upon God and his goodness and his grace and his mercy. And then John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Do you know what he's saying here? There we are in our filth, in our sin, in darkness, in the most vile, gross acts of immorality. 
And God goes, mine. Here you go, Jesus. Save them by your blood. John is destroying all of the ancient religiosity of the Pharisees and the Sadducees here. He is destroying all false religions. He is destroying all misconceptions in that line when he says, You're, um, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the, of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. Gets better, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Prostitute, drug addict, politician, murderer, deceiver, wife abuser, and Adolf Hitler himself, if he professed Christ as his savior, could be saved if God so chose him. You did not choose me, but I chose you and pointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of my Father in my name, he will give to you. Gets better. Not only did he call you, cleanse you, secure you, he prays for you. John 17, 9. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on my behalf, of, uh, on behalf of the world, excuse me, but of those that you have given me, for they are yours. I'm undone. John, at the very beginning of this prologue, is showing you the doctrines of grace in such a small statement. And if you tie everything up I just said, he wants you to love him and trust him. He doesn't want his church running to Caesar asking how to be a better Roman. He doesn't want his church running to the temple of Moloch to be a better Philistine. He doesn't want his church to run to some guy with a paper degree on his wall asking him how to prolong your life a few measly years. He wants you to love him and to trust him. It's challenging. The Jews were challenged by this reality of Jesus being the true light, the true word, God himself. He was the one who was enlightening them to salvation. Mankind, darkness to light. And as I said earlier on, man always looks for the temporal light. We always want the temporary peace. We want the temporary promise. This is why sin is so rampant. We want that temporary pleasure. We want KFC, go get it and fill our faces full of fast food. We want everything temporary, but there is never absolute found in the temporary. We are not men and women called to follow the temporary, but to follow the eternal. The one who is light and life. The one who illuminates the way to salvation. The one who is our eternal peace. The one who is at the beginning with God, who is God, at the beginning of all creation. The one who became incarnate and walked among us. The one who suffered for us. The one who willingly went to the cross and took those nails. The one who bled for us and physically died. The one who was laid in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea. The one who said, trust me, I'm coming back. And on that third day, blew those seals open, opened the tomb, and walked out is the one who we are to follow. Why? Because God gave us the right to be children. Not by merit, not by work, not by blood of man except for the blood of Jesus Christ.